World War II came to an end in 1945, in May, in Europe, and then in August in the Pacific Theater. And as the rebuilding efforts began on a physical level, there needed to be spiritual renewal that happened throughout Europe and Japan as well. In Europe, particularly in Germany, there were Christian missionaries going around to speak a message of forgiveness. One of these happened to have been a woman who was a prisoner of war, or she was a political prisoner, in Ravensbrück. Some of you have heard of Cory ten Boom and the story that she wrote of her ordeal living through that experience in Ravensbrück, uh, where she and her sister Bessie were imprisoned and her sister actually died in prison. And it's a, it's a beautiful story of, of just getting through because they, they'd been in prison because they had actually been hiding Jews and they were found out by the Nazis. They were Dutch. And so uh, living in the Netherlands and, and near the sea, uh, this, the, the ideas of the ocean and, and just the, the, the power of God's mercy and the, the depths of God's mercy, comparable to the depths of the sea, play into many of the stories that Corrie ten Boom tells. And so she was in Germany in 1947, telling one of her stories, and she was in the basement of a church. It wasn't a Catholic church. She herself was a Protestant, so she was very, very immersed in the Word of God, in the Scriptures, but she did not have the other sacraments. Um, she had baptism, obviously. But she was in the basement of a church talking about God's mercy one evening, and she said that she looked out in the congregation and she saw a face she thought she recognized. And as soon as the talk was over, people began to disperse and she said it was very quiet because no one asked questions in those days. There was, there was no Q&A, there was no talking about anything. There was just the grim reality of what had happened the five years previous. And everyone's leaving except this man who's in a overcoat and a hat. And he begins to approach the podium where she had been speaking. And she recognized him and she thought, oh my gosh, that's one of those guards. And she remembered him. And she, she blinked and she saw him in his uniform and she blinked again and he was dressed in civilian clothes. And he came up and he said to her these words. He said, a fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And he said that he had become a Christian in the days after the war. And so he was actually baptized. Then he, he said to her, Fraulein, I would like to hear from you. Will you forgive me? And he reaches out his hand. And so this is a, a man who had beaten prisoners, who was extremely cruel, but who had experienced God's mercy in some way. And now, after all of the stories of forgiveness that Corrie ten Boom had been telling for two years, she actually was going to have to live this in a real way. Because here is the man who's extended his hand and she doesn't know what to do and she freezes as she starts fumbling with her notes a little bit. But she sees him and she's made eye contact with him. And she didn't, she, she said, I felt nothing. I was cold because I knew how cruel that man had been. And then she said a quick little prayer and she said, Jesus, help me. That's all she could say in her heart because she felt no emotion. She felt no desire to forgive this guy. And she said, well, I can do the next right thing. And the next right thing to do would be to shake the man's hand. And so she did. And she says, as soon as their hands met, in her shoulder, she just felt this warmth, almost as if God had put his hand on her shoulder and had maybe even guided her arm. And the warmth went down her arm and they ended up embracing, or uh, shaking hands and then embracing after that. And she said, of course, sir, I forgive you. And there was this moment of reconciliation. And she realized in that moment that there were times when you were going to need to just call upon God in a very profound way like that, as, as she did, is she called out for Jesus to help her. And she said, 
at the end of the little story I was reading about this encounter, she said, if there's one thing I've learned at 80 years of age, it's that I can't store up good feelings and behavior, but only draw them fresh from God each day. I can only draw upon those, that, that good behavior that I need that daily dose of God's grace every day. And this coming from a woman who herself was not a Catholic, but a woman who prayed devoutly every day, one who very much followed Jesus and saw him as the way, the truth, and the life. And so following her example, how is it that we follow Christ as our way, our truth, and our life, as he's described to us in the gospel, because this is probably one of the most famous teachings of Jesus. He, he starts off, do not let your hearts be troubled, but then he gives us a path to follow. He says that I am the way. He is the way to the Father. He is the way to heaven. And heaven not as some eternal Disneyland. Uh, heaven is as something much deeper than that. As, as much more glorious than that because we will behold God in all his glory in heaven. And to have, to be there with all of our friends and family and those who have lived well in this life, who have died as a friend of God, who desired to serve him. But Jesus lays out the way for us. And we, he finds out as he's having this discussion in today's gospel with the apostles, they find out that, you know, the way is not going to be the way that they would choose. The way Jesus lays out is going to be a way of suffering and for him, death on the cross, but eventually resurrection and ascension into heaven. And so for his, his apostles and for all of his followers, it will be no different for us. The part of the way is going to include some suffering and some persecution. And that if you feel persecuted at times, especially persecuted for your faith, well, then you're probably on the right track. That's not a very consoling thought some days when we're in the thick of a, you know, being picked on. But there is some consolation in knowing that, that Christ went that way before us. Even in times of temptation from the devil, and you, you're like, why won't he leave me alone? Be gone, Satan. But even in times of temptation, you know, you must be good enough to be tempted. You must be worthwhile that the devil's trying to throw you off track. You must be going the right path. You're doing something right. Jesus is the way, and he lays out the way for us. He lays out the way to the Father. One of the things I love in the Chapel of Divine Mercy, these words of the chaplet that are written around on the wall up above. And the whole orientation of the prayer of the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, you know, that for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. Asking the Father for that mercy, almost, and beseeching him, you know, to, to reminding him, as it were, of the, the, what Jesus did on our behalf, and, and really tapping into the, the graces and the glory that, that Jesus paved the way for us, that we are asking for his mercy. So Jesus is the way, and he has paved the way for us. Jesus is the truth. And we know that, that truth, uh, as the correspondence of mind and reality, uh, as God has, has arranged nature, as he's made us with sight and the ability to hear and to smell, we can trust our senses. We can trust what we see. Unless it's very obviously, you know, something that is, is out, of, out of kilter, you know. There's, there's things, though, that, that core realities that do not change. And there were truths that existed in the world before I did, and, and there's things that I cannot change. And that's why we teach children from the youngest ages the difference between right and wrong. There are good things to do. And as we pass on the faith things that we, we want them to grow in love of God, in love of neighbor. And in the world today, though, we know that there are attacks on the truth and the, the, the blatant, the deliberate people going out of their way to undermine truth. And um, I mean, most obviously in, in, in the news, I guess the, this wokeness 
the woke mind virus and the way that it attacks truth. And, you know, I think uh, people trying to redefine reality as they want it and, and not as they see it. And what's so sad is, is people are trying to redefine reality because the reality of some of their situations are so painful. It's hard to live in, in the brokenness of their life the brokenness of their bad decisions, the brokenness of their family life. And so they, they think, well, maybe I can recreate something. And so there's a, a decision to change my identity. And, and this whole transgenderism thing, it's an obvious attack on the way that God has created us, male and female. That's very fundamental. You don't get any more fundamental than, than the beginning of Genesis. And male and female, God has created us. Uh, you know, I don't think even the evolutionists had an idea about anything with transgenderism. You know, you, even if you took God out of the equation and, and denied that, you know, if you wanted to believe in evolution in some way, it's always been male and female, even for the evolutionists. And, you know, the, the whole transgender agenda is a new religion. It is a new religion. And its adherents are militant in following it. And it is frightening. It is very frightening. And we, we pray for those who might experience this gender dysphoria, but we certainly aren't going to promote or adhere to their dangerous ideology. And we want to help those people who have that confusion, but it's a mental health problem. It's, it's not a problem of reality. Reality is what it is. Uh, and, and so we need to get help for those who might experience this. Uh, the, the whole discussion, you know, with some of this, this transgenderism. And, and there is one truth, though, that has come to light that I'm very thankful for in, in the discussion. And it's come out in the news in the last month, especially since April 1st. And it's had to do with Anheuser-Busch. And the fact that Bud Light is really bad beer to begin with. And so, uh, you know, if they experience a boycott and so forth, that's on them because they, they wanted to have there, and it's, it's interesting because if, if God, if your money is God and making money is your God and that is your bottom line, then, you know, when you, it's a slippery slope and they are sliding down the slope because they've upset their, many of their customers. And now apparently this week there was a, a little bit of backpedaling and a kind of apology. And now they've upset the leftists. And so they're getting it from both sides right now. I don't know what happens. And the sad part of this too is there's good common blue collar people who work at those businesses who are the ones who are gonna lose their jobs or they're the ones who are gonna suffer ultimately. And the people who run these companies who are really infected with a woke mind virus, they're not gonna suffer. Yeah, they'll, their names will get in the news for a little while, but then they'll just go on to their next endeavor because they probably have enough money to move on. And, and the sad part is, is there any real conversion or are they just, do they just continue to serve their money, which is their God, which is their, sorry, their God, which is money? I don't know. And so that's why we do. We follow Jesus Christ, who is the truth, and we don't deny reality. Jesus said, I am the life. And how do we invite Christ's life? How do we receive Christ's life into our lives? Well, for us as Catholics, it is through the sacraments. It's, it's through baptism. It's through the Eucharist. It's through confession. It's through marriage, through all of the sacraments that we receive. But especially that, that sacrament of conversion and, and confession. It is so profound when a person converts that's why I started off with that story of the soldier and the guard in the camp with Corey Ten Boom, how profound it was that he converted from being hate-filled and a member of a vicious, hateful party where that, you know, the Nazis, and eventually he found God, and he was sincerely sorry for having done the things that he did. St. Thomas Aquinas talks about the conversion of the sinner, and he says, what is remarkable is that, and greater works than these he will do. Christ is speaking 
of this result or work when he says that believers will also do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do. Because in the gospel, Jesus was talking about the apostles performing greater works than even the uh, performing of the, the healing of the blind man or the healing of the centurion servant or the multiplication of the loaves and fish, the uh, raising of Lazarus from the dead. Jesus, and St. Thomas is commenting on this, Jesus says, there will be greater works even than those miracles that I performed. St. Thomas goes on. For the justification of the wicked is a greater work than the creation of heaven and earth. For the justification of the wicked, considered in itself, continues forever. But the heavens and the earth will pass away. And so despite all the great things that the apostles have seen and even some of the things they have done, that conversion of a sinner, because that soul is eternal and it will last forever, in heaven or in hell, and that's dependent upon how they live today and how they continue living today. And that, that's why we do. We pray for the conversion of sinners. That's why we pray the chaplet of divine mercy and we pray for that mercy to be showered down upon the whole world. And the Eucharist, the Eucharist is going to aid us in growing in charity, in growing in love. And, and we need that because it is going to expand that charity in our souls. We see that charity at work on a practical level in the first reading today where the deacons were at work and they were assigned to take care of the temporal needs of the widows who were being neglected. But on a spiritual level, that expansion of charity in our souls, loving those people who are difficult to love. And like Corey Ten Boom, in the moment just saying, Jesus, help me, I need your help right now because I can't do this on my own. How, how she was able to, to have that deep of faith, that is a grace from God that she had received. And I'm ashamed to say that I don't always, I don't think I live up to that level of faith some days. And I receive Jesus in the Eucharist daily. But we're practicing Catholics. We're practicing to get better. We're works in progress. And so that's why we do. We call upon the Lord and we, we ask for that, that grace. We ask for that charity, especially in receiving him in Holy Communion on a daily basis. We circle back around to the altar daily when possible, at least every week, but daily when possible. Jesus says elsewhere in St. John's Gospel to give us consolation, to give us the, the peace that we need, that we will make it through these trying days. He says... In the world you will have tribu tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Praise to be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen.